Chapter 1. Out of the East. Early in 1347, a mysterious disease attacked people living near the Black Sea in what is now southern Ukraine. Its victims suffered from headaches, felt weak and tired, and staggered when they tried to walk. By the third day, the lymph nodes in the sufferers' groins or occasionally their armpits began to swell. Soon they reached the size of hen's eggs. These swellings became known as buboes, from the Greek word for groin, bubon. They gave the disease its official name, the bubonic plague. The victim's heart beat wildly as it tried to pump blood through the swollen tissues. The nervous system started to collapse, causing dreadful pain and bizarre movements of the arms and legs. Then, as death neared, the mouth gaped open and the skin blackened from internal bleeding. The end usually came on the fifth day. Within weeks of the first reported cases, hundreds of people in the Black Sea region had sickened and died. Those who survived were terrified. Like the citizens of Athens at the time of the plague, they had no medicines with which to fight the disease. As it continued to spread, their fear changed to frustration and then to anger. Someone, some outsider, must be responsible for bringing this calamity upon them. The most likely candidates were the Italian traders who operated in the region. They bartered Italian goods for the silks and spices that came over the caravan routes from the Far East, then shipped the Eastern merchandise on to Italy. Although many of the traders had lived in the region for years, they were still thought of as being different. For one thing, they were Christians, while most of the natives were Muslims. Deciding the Italians were to blame for the epidemic, the natives gathered an army and prepared to attack their trading post. The Italians fled to a fortress they had built on the coast of the Black Sea. There the natives besieged them until the dread disease broke out in the Muslim army. The natives were forced to withdraw, but before they did, according to one account, they gave the Italians a taste of the agony their people had been suffering. They loaded catapults with the bodies of some of their dead soldiers and hurled them over the high walls into the fortress. By doing so, they hoped to infect the Italians with the plague. As fast as the bodies landed, the Italians dumped them into the sea. However, they did not move quickly enough, for the disease had already taken hold among them. In a panic, the traders loaded three ships and set sail for their home port of Genoa, Italy. They made it only as far as Messina on the island of Sicily before the rapid spread of the disease forced them to stop. This account of what happened in southern Ukraine may or may not be true, but it is fact that the bubonic plague, the Black Death, arrived in Sicily in October 1347, carried by the crew of a fleet from the east. All the sailors on the ships were dead or dying. In the words of a contemporary historian, they had sickness clinging to their very bones. The harbor masters at the port of Messina ordered the sick sailors to remain on board, hoping in this way to prevent the disease from spreading to the town. They had no way of knowing that the actual carriers of the disease had already left the ships. Under cover of night, when no one could see them, they had scurried down the ropes that tied the ships to the dock and vanished into Messina. The carriers were black rats and the fleas that lived in their hair. Driven by an unending search for food, the rat's ancestors had migrated slowly westward along the caravan routes. They had traveled in bolts of cloth and bales of hay, and the fleas had come with them. Although it was only an eighth of an inch long, the rat flea was a tough, adaptable creature. It depended for nourishment on the blood of its host, which it obtained through a dagger-like snout that could pierce the rat's skin, and in its stomach the flea often carried thousands of the deadly bacteria that caused the bubonic plague. The bacteria did no apparent harm to the flea, and the black rat could tolerate a moderate amount of them, too, without showing ill effects. But sometimes the flea contained so many bacteria that they invaded the rat's lungs or nervous system when the flea injected its snout. Then the rat died a swift and horrible death, and the flea had to find a new host. Aiding the tiny flea in its search were its powerful legs, which could jump more than 150 times the creature's length. In most instances, the flea landed on another black rat. Not always, though. 
If most of the rats in the vicinity were already dead or dying from the plague, the flea might leap to a human being instead. As soon as it had settled on the human skin, the flea would begin to feed, and the whole process of infection would be repeated. No doubt it was fleas, not Italian traders, that brought the bubonic plague to the Black Sea region, and other fleas that carried the disease on to Sicily. But no one at the time made the connection. To the people of the 14th century, the cause of the Black Death, which they called the pestilence, was a complete and utter mystery. When the first cases of the plague were reported in Messina, the authorities ordered the Italian fleet and all its sick crew members to leave the port at once. Their action came too late, however. Within days, the disease had spread throughout the city and the surrounding countryside. Some of the plague's victims fled to the nearby town of Catania where they were treated kindly at first, but when the citizens of Catania realized how deadly the disease was, they refused to have anything more to do with anyone from Messina or even to speak to them. As was to happen wherever the plague stuck, fear for one's own life usually outweighed any concern a person might have felt for the life of another. From Sicily, trading ships loaded with infected flea-bearing rats carried the Black Death to ports on mainland of Italy, Peddlers and other travelers helped spread it to inland cities such as Milan and Florence. Conditions in these medieval cities provided a splendid breeding ground for all types of vermin, including rats. There were no regular garbage collections and refuse accumulated in piles in the streets. Rushes from wet or marshy places, not rugs, covered the floors in most homes. After a meal, it was customary to throw bits of leftover food into the rushes for the dog or cat to eat. Rats and mice often got their share, too. Because the cities had no running water, even the wealthy seldom washed their heavy clothing or their own bodies. As a result, both rich and poor were prime targets for lice and fleas and the diseases they carried, the most deadly being the bubonic plague. Several Italian commentators noted an unusual number of dead rats in cities struck by the plague. Seems odd that no one linked this phenomenon to the disease. Perhaps people were so used to being surrounded by vermin, dead and alive, that a few more didn't arouse that much of a concern. At any rate, the Italians sought other explanations for the terrible pestilence. Some scholars thought the plague had been triggered by a series of earthquakes that had devastated large areas of Europe and Asia between 1345 and 1347. They said the quakes had released poisonous fumes from the Earth's core, and some believed the devil was behind it all. Others claimed that climatic changes had brought warmer, damper weather and strong southerly winds that carried the disease north. They tried to predict its course by studying the colors of the sky at twilight and the shapes of cloud formations. Meanwhile, the death toll in both city and countryside continued to mount. At Venice, one of Italy's major ports, the city leaders decreed that no one could have an incoming ship for quaranta giorni, forty days, the length of time Christ was said to have suffered in the wilderness. From this decree comes the word quarantine which means an isolation or restriction on travel intended to keep a contagious disease from spreading. But the quarantine in Venice proved no more effective than the one imposed earlier at Messina. When the Black Death struck in December 1347, Venice had a population of about 130,000. Eighteen months later, only about 70,000 Venetians were still alive. Other Italian cities tried harsher measures to halt the spread of the disease. As soon as the first cases were reported in Milan, the authorities sent the city militia to wall up the houses where the victims lived. All those inside, whether sick or well, were cut off from their friends and neighbors and left to die. The most complete account of the Black Death in Italy was given by the writer Giovanni Boccaccio, who lived in the city of Florence. In the preface to his classic book, The Decameron, Boccaccio wrote, Some say that the plague descended upon the human race through the influence of the heavenly bodies, others that it was a punishment signifying God's righteous anger at our wicked way of life. After describing the disease's symptoms, 
Boccaccio went on to say, against these maladies it seemed that all the advice of physicians and all the power of medicine were profitless and futile. Perhaps the nature of the illness was such that it allowed no remedy, or perhaps those people were treating the illness, being ignorant of its causes, were not prescribing the appropriate cure. One of the most alarming things about the bubonic plague was the way it struck. It would rush upon its victims with the speed of a fire racing through dry or oily substances that happened to be placed within its reach, Boccaccio wrote. Not only did it infect healthy persons who conversed or had any dealings with the sick, but it also seemed to transfer the sickness to anyone touching the clothes or the objects which had been handled or used by the victims. Boccaccio reported seeing two pigs in the street rooting through the ragged clothes of a poor man who had died of the plague. Within a short time, the pigs began to writhe and squirm as though they had been poisoned. Then they both dropped dead, falling on the same rags they had been pulling and tugging at a few minutes earlier. How did the people of Florence react to this mysterious and fatal disease? Some isolated it themselves in their homes, according to Boccaccio. They ate lightly, saw no outsiders, and refused to receive reports of the dead or sick. Others adopted an attitude of play today, for we die tomorrow. They drank heavily, stayed out late, and roamed through the streets, singing and dancing, as if the Black Death were an enormous joke. Still others, if they were rich enough, abandoned their homes in the city and fled to villas in the countryside. They hoped in this way to escape the disease, but often it followed them. Whatever steps they took, the same percentage of people in each group seemed to fall ill. So many died that the bodies piled up in the streets. A new occupation came into being, that of loading the bodies on carts and carrying them away for burial in mass graves. No more respect was accorded to dead people, Bukaki wrote, than would be shown toward dead goats. The town of Siena, 30 miles south of Florence, suffered severe losses also. A name, a man named Agnolo di Tura offered a vivid account of what happened there. The mortality in Siena began in May. It was a horrible thing, and I do not know where to begin to tell of the cruelty. Members of a household brought their dead to a ditch as best they could without a priest, without any divine services. Nor did the death bell sound, and as soon as those dishes were filled, more were dug. I, Agnolo di Tura, buried my five children with my own hands, and no bells tolled and nobody wept, no matter what his loss, because almost everyone expected death. And people said, and believed, this is the end of the world. By the winter of 1348 to 1349, a little more than a year after its first appearance in Sicily, the worst of the Black Death was over in Italy. No one knows exactly how many Italians died of the disease because accurate medical records were not kept. Conservative estimates put the loss at about a third of the population, but many scholars believed the death rate reached 40 or 50 percent, especially in the cities. In any case, it was the greatest loss of human life Italy had suffered in a comparable period of time, and a loss not equaled to the present day. Meanwhile, the Black Death had swept on to France, entering that country via Marseille and other southern ports. Before long, it traveled inland and reached the city of Avignon, where the Pope was then living. Chapter 2. Between Two Raging Fires when the Black Death arrived in Avignon in the spring of 1348, this old walled city in southern France had been the home of the Pope and his College of Cardinals for almost 40 years. They had come there in 1309 to escape political unrest in Rome and had built a magnificent palace on the city's main square. Pilgrims, priests, and diplomats crowded into Avignon from all over Europe to pay their respects to the Pope. Without meaning to, some of these visitors must have brought the pestilence with them. Between February and May, up to 400 people a day died of the plague in Avignon. When the graveyards were filled, the bodies of the dead had to be dumped into the Rhone River, which flowed through the heart of the city. Many courageous priests ministered to the sick and dying, even though they knew they would probably become infected and die themselves.
Meanwhile, Pope Clement VI decided it was his duty, as leader of the Roman Catholic Church on the earth, to remain alive, if at all possible. On the advice of his physician, he withdrew to his private rooms, saw nobody, and spent day and night between two fires that blazed on grates at opposite ends of his bedchamber. What purpose were the fires supposed to serve? It was tied into the theory of humors, which still dominated medical thought for the 14th century. This theory goes back to the Greek physician Hippocrates, who lived from about 484 to 425 BC and is often called the father of medicine. Hippocrates examined sick persons carefully and honestly recorded the signs and symptoms of various diseases. But his knowledge of how the human body worked was extremely limited. He believed the body contained four basic liquids, which he called humors, blood, which came from the heart, phlegm from the brain, yellow bile from the liver, and black bile from the spleen. If these humors were in balance, Hippocrates wrote a person would enjoy good health. But if one of them became more important than the others, the person was likely to feel pain and fall victim to a disease. A physician's main job, therefore, was to try to restore and maintain a proper balance among the four humors. Blood and bile. Another Greek physician, Galen, took the idea of Hippocrates a step further. Galen stated that the four humors in the human body reflected the four elements that people believed were the basis of all life. Earth, air, fire, and water. Blood was hot and moist, like the air in summer. Phlegm was cold and moist, like water. Yellow bile was hot and dry, like fire. And black bile was cold and dry, like earth. In other words, according to Galen, the human body was a smaller, contained version of the wider natural world. Galen recommended certain treatments to keep the humors in balance. For example, if a patient was too hot, various foods were prescribed to make him or her cooler. If this treatment failed, the physician might perform bloodletting to reduce the amount of hot blood in a patient's system. Most of Galen's theories had been discredited in modern times, but for over a thousand years until the 16th century, no physician thought of questioning them. There were several reasons why this was so. One was the fact that the Roman Catholic Church led the way in education as well as religion during the Middle Ages. Convinced that everything in the world was under divine control, church leaders frowned on independent thought and scientific experimentation. In 1300, for example, Pope Boniface III decreed that anyone who dared to cut up a dead human body would be banned from the church. This edict, in effect, outlawed the dissection of corpses in medical schools and prevented students from gaining a better understanding of the body's organs and how they were related. Any dissection that was done had to be performed on the bodies of pigs, not people. In this climate, it was easier for physicians to rely on Galen, who seemed to have an explanation for everything, than pursue original medical investigations of their own. Most medieval physicians were actually scholar priests. They spent their time analyzing the writings of Galen's and Hippocrates and left the treatment of patients to surgeons and barber surgeons. Surgeons usually had some medical training in a university. They were regarded as skilled craftsmen, able to close wounds, set broken bones, and perform simple operations. Most barber surgeons were illiterate men whose only training came from serving as apprentices to surgeons. As their name implies, they cut hair as well as setting simple fractures and bandaging wounds. Some say the traditional red and white striped barber's pole comes from the time when barber surgeons hung their bloody surgical rags in front of their shops to dry. Two other groups of people played important roles in medieval medicine. Apothecaries filled prescriptions and also prescribed herbs and drugs on their own. Non-professionals, many of them, older women, provided medical care in rural areas where no surgeons or barber surgeons were available. These non-professionals had no formal training and relied heavily on folk remedies that had been handed down from generation to generation in the countryside.
strange treatments. This, then, was the medical scene when the Black Death raged through Western Europe in the mid-14th century. It helps to explain why physicians and surgeons were at such a loss to know what caused the epidemic, let alone how to treat it. It also answers the question of why the Pope's physician had him sit alone in his bedchamber between two raging fires. Galen had written that diseases were transmitted from person to person by miasmas, poisonous vapors that arose from swamps and corrupted the air. The Pope's physician, who believed in Galen's theories, thought that hot air from the fires would combat any dangerous miasmas that got into the Pope's chamber and render them harmless. The Pope did survive, but it's doubtful whether the fires had anything to do with it except to make his chamber uncomfortable for rats and fleas. Other physicians and surgeons interpreted Galen's theories differently. Instead of fighting fire with fire, so to speak, they recommended fleeing from it. People were urged to leave warm, low, marshy places that were likely to produce miasmas and move to drier, cooler regions in the hills. If that was not possible, they were advised to stay indoors during the heat of the day, cover up over any brightly lighted windows, and try to stay cool. Hands and feet were to be washed regularly, but physicians warned against bathing the body because it opened the pores. This, they thought, made the body more vulnerable to attack by disease-bearing miasmas. Exercise was to be avoided for the same reason. Sleep after eating in the middle of the day was bad because the body was warmer then, and physicians cautioned their patients not to sleep on their backs at any time because that made it easier for foul air to flow down into their nostrils and get into their lungs. To ward off miasmas when one walked outside, physicians recommended carrying bouquets of sweet-smelling herbs and flowers and holding them up to the nose. Some say this practice was one of the inspirations for the old English nursery rhyme, Ring Around the Rosies. In the first published version, it read as follows. Ring around a roses, a pocket full of posies, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Those who link the rhyme to the plague think the ring of roses was the rash that often signaled infection. The pocket full of posies referred to the flowers people carried to sweeten the air around them. A tissue was the sound of sneezing, a common symptom of the disease, and we all fall down implied that all of its victims died. Some prescribed treatments for the plague seemed sensible, or at least harmless. Bed rest, drinking lots of liquids, and the application of salves made of herbs to the affected areas of the body— but other treatments hurt plague sufferers instead of helping them. Surgeons who had studied Galen's theories believed that the Black Death interpreted the flow of the body's humors. Since the heart produced the most important of these liquids, blood, doctors thought, one effective way to fight the plague and improve circulation was to bleed veins close to the heart. The surgeons also thought that buboes, the swellings that characterized the disease, revealed where the body was being attacked, and they geared their treatment accordingly. If a bubo appeared in the region of the groin, for example, the surgeon drained blood from a vein leading to one of the organs in that area. By doing so, the surgeon meant to cool the body and help it fight the disease, but in fact, bleeding only weakened the body's defenses. St. Roche in the face of treatments like these, it's no wonder that people lost faith in their physicians and came to rely more and more on prayer. Many directed their prayers to St. Roche, who had died in 1327 and was particular saint associated with the plague. According to the legends told about him in France and Italy, Roche inherited great wealth as a young man. Like St. Francis, he gave it away to the poor and then went on a religious pilgrimage to Italy. He was in Rome when, when an epidemic struck, but instead of fleeing, Roche stayed on to nurse the sick. Eventually, he caught the disease himself. Roche left the city and went to the countryside, where he expected to die alone in the woods. But a dog, carrying a loaf of bread in its mouth, miraculously found him. Each day, the dog reappeared with a fresh loaf, and Roche gradually recovered. He got home to France safely, but his relatives failed to recognize him, and he had Ro and had Roche arrested as an impostor. 
He died in jail, filling his cell with a mysterious white light. After Roche's story spread and he was made a saint, it was thought he would come to the aid of plague victims, just as the dog had come in his aid in the Roman woods. Even prayers to St. Roche did not halt the relentless march of the Black Death through France, however. At the peak of the plague, the death rate in Paris was reported to be 800 a day. By the time the epidemic had run its course in 1349, over 50,000 Parisians had died, half the city's population. Meanwhile, the Black Death had crossed the English Channel and was wreaking fresh havoc in the British Isles. Chapter 3. Looking for Scapegoats from a distance, the English village looked calm and peaceful under the summer sun of 1349. The thatched roofs of its cottages seemed to glisten in the haze. Beyond the cottages, the grass in the village pastureland was a lush green, and the oak trees in the wood were thick with leaves. But a visitor who came closer would have seen that all was not well in the village. The doors of some cottages hung open, revealing that the inhabitants had fled in haste. From other dwellings came the moans of people in pain. A woman who had just drawn water from the village well collapsed from fever or fatigue when she tried to lift her bucket. The sense of dread and decay was even more noticeable in the fields around the village. Weeds crowded out the growing crops of oats and barley, indicating that no one had cultivated them in some time. Two pigs were loose in the vegetable garden, rooting among the beans and cabbages, a cow had wandered off into the woods. This was a typical scene in the English countryside the year the Black Death struck. Nearly 90% of the population lived in villages ranging in size from large ones containing 500 or more inhabitants to small ones made of just 10 or 12 families. Large or small, they were all affected by the plague. Henry Knighton, a clergyman at Leicester Cat Abbey, left an eyewitness account of the damage. He wrote, Sheep and cattle were left to wander through the fields and among the standing crops, since there was no one to drive them off for, or collect them. For want of people to look after them, they died in hedgerows and ditches all over the country. So few servants and laborers were left that nobody knew where to turn for help. The following autumn, it was not possible to get a harvester except by paying eight pence a day, a large amount then, with food included. Because of this, many crops were left to rot in the fields. Another chronicler from an abbey near the town of Lincoln wrote an even more vivid account of the plague's ravages. It filled the whole world with terror, he said, in places not even a fifth of people of the part were left alive. So great an epidemic has never been seen nor heard of before this time, for it is believed that even the waters of the flood, which happened in the days of Noah, did not carry off so vast a multitude. In the face of such horror, some people blamed themselves for the epidemic. This surely must be caused by the sins of men, said the Archbishop of York. He urged his followers to join in group prayers and religious processions in an attempt to ward off the pestilence. Others, like the residents along the Black Sea, who were among the first victims of the Black Death, looked for someone else to blame, an outsider, or just someone who was different. On the edges of many villages and poor huts made of sticks and straw lived outcasts of various kinds. Some were deformed from birth, others were simple-minded, still others were insane. The villagers gave them names like Poor Tom or Mad Mag, the majority were harmless, although children sometimes taunted them and called the old women witches. Most adults simply left them alone. That changed when the Black Death came. As more people sickened and died, the survivors became increasingly frustrated. Neither the village priest nor the barber surgeon had a solution for the plague. In many instances, they were among its victims. Maybe the children were right. The fearful survivors thought maybe Mad Mag really was a witch. If they got rid of her, maybe the pestilence would finally go away. At the height of the plague, there were reports from many English villages of local eccentrics being stoned or beaten to death by crowds of their angry, frightened neighbors. But the worst cases of such violence occurred in Germany when the Black Death arrived there. The Flagellants one group of Germans carried self-blame to its furthest extreme. 
These were the people known as flagellants because they literally whipped themselves. Small bands of flagellants had roamed across Central Europe for years, seeking God's forgiveness by punishing themselves for their sins. The number of participants increased dramatically during the years of the Black Death. The flagellants were organized in groups of several hundred or more under the leadership of a man they called Master or Father. Each member of the group swore obedience to the Master for a period of 33 and a half days, representing the number of years Jesus Christ was said to have lived on the earth. During that time, the flagellants could not bathe, shave, or sleep on soft beds, and they could not speak to anyone without the permission of the Master. Dressed in hooded white robes with red fabric crosses sewn on the front and back, the flagellants went from town to town in long, winding processions. They walked two by two, the men in front, the women bringing up the rear. When they came to a new town, they made their way to the biggest church, which was usually located in the central square. There, each man removed his outer robe, and wearing only a long, skirt-like garment, prepared to begin the standard ritual. They marched slowly in a circle around the master, crying aloud to God to spare them, and singing hymns. All the while, they beat their bare backs and shoulders with leather whips, tipped with small iron spikes. Often the spikes drew blood, which only made the flagellants sing and chant more loudly. In their suffering, they believed that they were reenacting Christ's agony on the cross. At last, on a signal from the master, they all fell to the ground and lay face downward, sobbing. Twice each day, the flagellants performed this rite, while a crowd of townspeople looked on. Some were frightened by the flagellants, but the majority of Germans admired them. They invited the flagellants into their homes, provided them with food, and gave them candles for their rites, and all, all in the hope that the flagellants' self-punishing behavior would persuade God to halt the plague. In time, though, the flagellants went too far. The warm reception they received in town after town made them think they could do anything they wanted. They even challenged the Roman Catholic Church, interrupting religious services, stealing valuables, and claiming that they, not the priests of the church, were the true representatives of God on the earth. At last, Pope Clement acted. In October 1349, he issued a bull, or decree, condemning flagellantism and urging authorities everywhere to outlaw the flagellants and their cruel rituals. The Pope's decree was heeded quickly. And by 1350, the flagellant movement had been almost completely wiped out in Western Europe. In the meantime, though, the flagellants had stirred up trouble of a different kind. Having failed through their actions to slow or stop the, fla the plague, the flagellants needed a scapegoat, someone or something, to bear the blame for their failure. They found a convenient target, the Jews. The First Holocaust For centuries, the Jews of Europe had been treated like outcasts. Christianity was the official religion in most Western European countries, and the Jews were scorned as non-believers. They were called Christ-killers, or worse. Some church officials even claimed that Jews kidnapped and tortured Christian children in reenactments of the crucifixion. Because they were considered to be aliens— Jews enjoyed no civil rights. They were banned from all government posts, could not serve in the army or own land, and were not permitted to work as craftsmen. In 1213, Pope Innocent III decreed that both sexes from the age of seven or eight had to wear circular badges of yellow felt that identified them as Jews. Almost 600 years after the arrival of the Black Plague in the 1930s and 40s, the Nazis made the Jews of Germany and the occupied countries wear similar yellow emblems in the shape of a six-pointed Star of David. One of the few occupations open to Jews was money lending. This was because the church forbade Christians from using money to, take, to make money, 
However, the Jews had to charge interest rates of 20% or more in order to pay the high taxes levied on their businesses. These rates angered the people who came to the Jews for loans and made them more willing to believe the rumors spread by the flagellants and others that the Jews were responsible for the Black Death. According to the rumors, the Jews were polluting the wells in Christian communities with poisons imported from Moorish Spain and the Far East. If Christians drank water from the wells, the rumor mongers claimed they would be infected with the plague and die. It's hard to know why these rumors started, since no one who had spoken or written of the pestilence asserted that it was caused by impure water. Perhaps they came from the fact that the Jews' religious laws made them more aware of hygiene. Consequently, they often avoided using wells that were close to sewage pits and obtained water instead from clear streams and springs, even if it meant going farther from their homes. Whatever the explanation, the rumors led to 11 Jews being put on trial in September 1348. They were charged with having poisoned the wells in a small south, south German town. After hours of painful torture, the eleven confessed to the deed and said they had received the poison from a rabbi in Spain. The confessions were false, of course, wrung out of the Jews by their torturers, but that made no difference to those who wanted to believe the worst of them. All eleven men were condemned to death, and the news of their trial set off a wave of repression and terror in other German and Swiss cities. In January 1349, the 200 Jewish residents of Basel, Switzerland, were herded into a wooden building on an island in the Rhine River and burned alive. Protesting their innocence to the end, Jews were put to death in one city after another, at the town of Speyer, bodies of murdered Jews were packed into huge, empty wine casks and sent floating off down the Rhine. In most places, the massacres occurred while the Black Death was attacking the population, but in some cities, word that the disease was coming was enough to arouse the citizens. On February 14, 1349, several weeks before the first cases of bubonic plague were reported, 2,000 Jews were killed in the city of Strasbourg. As the Jews marched under guard through the city on their way to the execution ground, some members of the watching crowd tore the clothes off the Jews' backs. They thought they might find gold pieces hidden in the linings. Some Christians tried to stop the slaughter. Pope Clement VI, from his residence in Avignon, condemned the killings and sent messages urging his followers to behave with tolerance toward the Jews. He and others pointed out that, proportionately, as many Jews had fallen victim to the plague as Christians, but the Pope's words were drowned out by continuing cries for revenge against the so-called poisoners of the wells. In August 1349, mobs led by the flagellants moved against the Jews in the large German cities of Cologne and Mainz. At Mainz, the Jews rebelled and attacked their oppressors, killing 200 according to one chronicler. Overpowered at last by the larger force of Christians, the Jews retreated to their homes and set them on fire. 3,000 Jews were said to have died in the blazing houses rather than be killed by their enemies. After the Horror The persecution of the Jews in Germany and elsewhere ended only when the death rate from the plague began to decline. By then, it is believed over 200 Jewish communities had been completely wiped out and 350 other massacres of Jews had taken place. Not until the Nazi Holocaust during World War II would the Jewish people again suffer such overwhelming losses. Many of the survivors fled Germany and moved to Eastern Europe. A large number settled in Poland, where King Casimir offered them special protection. As the Jews labored to rebuild their lives, they tried to forget the horrors of the Black Death. So did the rest of Europe, but it was impossible to ignore the hard facts of the epidemic. Before the plague, historians estimate, Europe had a population of about 75 million. In 1351, after the disease seemed to have run its course, Pope Clement's agents calculated that 23 million 
840,000 people had died of it, almost 32% of the population. This figure echoes the words of the contemporary chronicler Jean Frossart, who wrote, A third of the world died. As things turned out, Frossart spoke too soon, for although the worst was over by 1351, the Black Death didn't stay away. It broke out again in various parts of Europe at least once every ten years until the end of the century. Especially hard hit were the young who had not been exposed to the disease before. None of the later epidemics was as widespread as the first. When the disease ran out of fresh victims, it finally eased its grip in the early 1400s. By that time, Europe's population had been reduced by nearly 50%. The incredibly high death toll was just one of the plague's consequences. Like a revolution or a world war, the Black Death had a profound and lasting effect on every area of human activity. Chapter 4. A Changed World Once they got over their grief at the loss of loved ones and began to pick up the threads of their daily lives, the survivors of the Black Death realized that many things in the world had changed not just in the immediate environment, but in their deepest thoughts and feelings. The most obvious changes affected their livelihoods. If they were nobles, used to having hundreds of poorly paid serfs to farm their lands, they were faced with a severe labor shortage due to deaths from the plague. Those who rounded up help and put in crops then discovered there wasn't as big a market for them, again, because of the plague. Agricultural prices fell as a result, further weakening the nobles whose power and wealth depended on the value of their land holdings. The serfs, on the other hand, found themselves in a much stronger position after the plague. With their services in demand, many in England and elsewhere ran away from the estates to which they had been bound since birth. They either sought out other estates where they could bargain for better wages and live as free men, or went to cities like London in hope of learning a trade. As wages rose, even the poor enjoyed a higher standard of living. They ate better foods than before and wore finer clothing. For the first time in England, members of the working classes were seen in fur coats of sheep or lambskin. Until then, only nobles and high-ranking clergymen could afford to wear furs. A Loss of Faith Another major change occurred in the way people viewed the Roman Catholic Church. Before the Black Death, most Europeans accepted without question the word of the Church as expressed by its bishops and priests. The plague shattered that faith. While some priests sacrificed their lives to aid the sick and dying, others fled or isolated themselves. Whether they stayed or fled, it soon became apparent that none of them could explain why God had permitted such devastation. After the worst was over, the survivors felt a strong need for religious belief and hoped their faith in God and church might be restored. But, like the serfs, many of the remaining priests left their posts in the countryside and went to towns and cities in search of wealthier parishes. The English poet Will William Langland wrote about the unfortunate trend in his classic work, Piers Plowman. Parsons and parish priests complained to the bishop that their parishes were poor since the pestilence time, and asked leave and license in London to dwell, and sing requiems for stipends since sliver is sweet, silver is sweet. Pope Clement responded angrily to such behavior. What can you preach to the people, he asked his bishops in 1351, if on humility you yourselves are the proudest of the world, arrogant and given to pomp, if on poverty you are the most grasping and the most covetous. Despite these rumblings of discontent, the church continued to be one of the most powerful forces in the 14th century Europe. However, it never regained the complete authority it had enjoyed before the plague. Once people began to question the church's actions, they kept on questioning them. This eventually led to attempts to reform the Roman Catholic Church and then, in the 16th century, to the establishment of the first Protestant churches. More Questions <laughs> 
In the meantime, a questioning mood spread to other fields after the plague. Among them was medicine. Because Galen's theories and recommended treatments had failed to prevent or cure the disease, doctors gradually turned away from them in the years following the epidemic. Instead of analyzing Galen's philosophy, medical students at the University of Paris and other institutions took practical courses in anatomy and surgery. Despite continuing objections from the church, the students were permitted to dissect human bodies as part of their studies. For the first time, medical textbooks were published in English, French, German, and Italian, rather than Latin, which only university-educated physicians could understand. Now, ordinary men and women had access to medical guides and could begin to take control of their own health. To help restore the average person's confidence in the medical profession, doctors were asked to obey a code of ethics. One French code propo proposed by Guy de Choliac sounds remarkably up-to-date. Here are some of its rules. The doctor should be well-mannered and abhor false cures or practices. He should be affable to the sick, kind-hearted to his colleagues, wise in his prognostications. He should not be grasping in money matters, and then he will receive a salary com commensurate with his labors, the financial ability of his patients, and the success of the treatment. In medicine, as in other fields of study, there was a new emphasis on what is called the scientific method. Rather than rely on answers from some higher authority, followers of this method put forward a theory as to why something in nature works the way it does. Then they test the theory by careful observation and analysis until they are able to prove or disprove it. The scientific method encouraged European scholars to abandon their outworn ideas in favor of risk-taking and experimentation. This new daring led in turn to the great discoveries in technology, geography, and navigation that marked the following century. This is not to say that Gutenberg would have invented, wouldn't have invented movable type in 1456, or Columbus have sailed across the Atlantic to the Caribbean Islands in 1492 if the Black Death hadn't cleared the way for a new spirit in science. But it can't be disputed that by turning the, world, the old world upside down, the Black Death helped pave the way for the new. Chapter 5. The Plague Returns Although the bubonic plague never again claimed as many victims as in the 14th century, it had by no means vanished from the earth. The disease recurred here and there throughout mainland Europe and Great Britain during the 1500s. In 1664, it struck the city of London with such ferocity that the outbreak became known as the Great Plague. Out of a population estimated at, at 460,000, almost 70,000 Londoners died. King Charles, his family, and his staff left London for Hampton Court Palace. Many other city dwellers followed the king to the countryside. Shopkeepers went bankrupt for lack of customers. Servants dismissed by their employers who had left London were hired by the city to drive dead carts that carried the bodies of the plague's victims to cemeteries. All day long, the carts rumbled through the city streets while their drivers shouted, Bring out your dead! The Lord Mayor of London ordered all dogs and cats in the city to be killed because it was, because it was thought they were spreading the disease. Within days, officials announced that 40,000 dogs and perhaps five times as many cats had been destroyed. But instead of halting the plague, this slaughter only enabled it to spread more rapidly for the with the cats gone, the city's rats, the true carriers of the plague, could thrive and multiply. The London Board of Health believed, mistakenly, that most cases of the disease were transmitted person to person, from infected individuals to healthy ones. So, when someone was diagnosed as having the plague, the board enforced a strict 40-day quarantine on the person's house. A large red cross was painted on the front door, warning others to stay away, and guards were posted outside to make sure no one entered or left. The living conditions inside a marked house soon became unbearable, and sometimes friends or neighbors helped with the, the inhabitants to escape 
The English writer Samuel Pepys recorded one such instance in his famous diary. September 3rd, 1665, Lord's Day, Sunday. I went up to the vestry at the desire of the justices of the peace in order to to the doing of something for the keeping of the plague from growing. Among other stories, one was very passionate, methought, of a complaint brought against a man in the town for taking a child from London from an infected house. Alderman Hooker told us it was the child of a very able citizen in Gracious Street, a saddler, who had buried all the rest of his children of the plague, and himself and wife now being shut up and in despair of escaping, did desire only to save the life of this little child, and so prevailed to have it received stark naked into the arms of a friend, who brought it, having put it into fresh new clothes, to Greenwich, where, upon hearing the story, we did agree it should be permitted to be received and kept in the town." Pepys, an important official in the British Naval Department, remained in London for most of the plague's duration and often commented on its ravages. Although Pepys didn't say so, the parents in the above story probably removed their child's clothing before handing it over for fear the garments were contaminated. In the late fall of 1665, the death rate from the plague in London declined abruptly. During the last week in September... <clears throat> people had died. Four, 929 people had died. By the end of November, the toll dropped to 900 a week. People began to return to the city. On Christmas morning, Pepys was pleased to see a jolly wedding party passing in front of his house. Under control. By 1750, the bubonic plague had gradually faded out in Western Europe. The last flare-ups occurred in the eastern Mediterranean ports where the disease had surfaced 400 years earlier. For the next 100 years, only scattered cases of plague were reported. Then, in the mid-1800s, there were fresh outbreaks in the interior of China. They failed to attract much attention in the outside world until the disease reached the port cities of Canton and Hong Kong in 1894. Because these cities had trading contacts with Europe and the Americas as well as Asia, fears arose that a new worldwide pandemic might be starting. But medical science had made many advances since the time of the Black Death and the Great Plague of London. As a result of the pioneering work of Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch, medical researchers now had the weapons they needed to battle the bubonic plague. Pasteur had shown that harmful bacteria could produce disease, and Koch has, had discovered the specific bacteria that caused such diseases as anthrax and tuberculosis. Applying their methods, scientists from Japan and Switzerland examined plague victims in the Far East and succeeded for the first time in isolating the bacterium that caused the Black Death. Moreover, they were the first to observe that rats played a key role in transmitting the disease. Within the next few years, other scientists working in India and in what is now Taiwan grew the plague bacteria and rat fleas and demonstrated how it was transmitted from rodents to human beings. Their findings were discounted at first, however, because many authorities still believed the prime means of transmission was person to person. This was the attitude that prevailed in San Francisco between 1900 and 1904 when 121 cases of bubonic plague were reported and all but three of the victims died. City health officials refused to accept the idea that the disease was transmitted from rat to flea to human. Instead, they quarantined, or kept under close watch, thousands of Asian immigrants. Like the Jews in Germany at the time of the Black Death, the unfortunate Asians were suspected of being responsible for the plague. Only after these harsh measures failed to halt the disease did the officials heed the scientists' advice. They ordered that all incoming and outgoing ships be disinfected and organized massive sanitation cleanups in which approximately 700,000 rats were trapped and destroyed in San Francisco. They also lifted the restrictions on the city's Asian population. The last sizable plague epidemic in the United States occurred in Los Angeles in 1924-1925. Forty people contracted the disease and only two of them survived it. With the development of antibiotic drugs in the 1940s, this plague had become a treatable disease at last. 
the prompt use of streptomycin had reduced the death rate from bubonic plague to 5%. The disease remains a threat in those parts of the world where sanitary conditions are poor and antibiotics are not readily available. India, for example, experienced an epidemic of pneumonic plague, an even deadlier form of bubonic plague, as recently as September 1994. The pneumonic form occurs when plague bacteria spread from the lymph nodes to the lungs, causing pneumonia. Unlike bubonic plague, the pneumonic form can be transmitted easily from person to person through droplets in the air. The outbreak in India began in the industrial city of Surat, about 200 miles north of Bombay. After the first plague deaths were reported, officials in Surat closed all public gathering places, including schools, restaurants, movie theaters, and parks. As rumors circulated that hundreds had died, more than 200,000 panicky residents of Surat fled the city by bus, train, and car, just as residents of Florence, Milan, and other Italian cities fled to the countryside at the time of the Black Death. Indian health officials took immediate steps to combat the disease. They sent millions of tablets of the antibiotic drug tetracycline to hospitals and clinics in Surat and distributed hundreds of tons of DDT and other insecticides to kill the fleas that were spreading the disease. They also hired temporary rat catchers to trap and destroy as many members as possible of the Surat's huge rat population. Within two weeks, the situation seemed to be stabilizing. Although 54 people had died of the plague and thousands more remained in hospital isolation wards, anxiety about the epidemic had decreased. Most of the residents of Surat had returned to their homes and no confirmed cases of the disease had been found in other Indian cities. The Indian government has successfully controlled the epidemic, a New Delhi representative of the World Health Organization declared. This epidemic had been curbed, but there was no assurance that another outbreak would not occur in India or some other part of the world where conditions for the disease were favorable. It's unlikely, though, that an epidemic of bubonic or pneumonic plague could ever again attain the scale of the Black Death. While the plague was regularly attacking people throughout the world, another scourge was also bedeviling humankind. There was never a single pandemic of this disease as overwhelming as the Black Death, but it probably claimed even more victims in the long run, especially hard-hit were children. This scourge was smallpox.